Hi, my name is John. And my name is Lloyd. And we're the hosts of The Pint. A pop culture podcast. Lloyd, if you had to tell any of the people out there that might be listening to The Pint for the first time about anything uh, unsavory or disconcerting we might do on the show, what would you warn them about? Well, sometimes we drop spoilers and sometimes we swear like motherfucking sailors. Fuck yeah, we do. You heard it from him. You've been warned. Listen in. All right, so this is the Mars Attacks episode. You can tell by all the acts at the beginning, and, and uh, there was a story behind why we're doing this episode. So we always do episodes for the Pint Insiders. Those are the folks that go and give us the, the two fifty wonderful $2.50 a month and get to shape the show in the whole nine yards. And we don't really do much of anything like for regular listeners anymore. Because well, hey, look, two fifty is king, right? Like we need we That's need right. that money. We did, we did that regular listener stuff for years. We did it for years. years. We did it for years, and now we're, we got a pay tier and the whole nine yards. But I was recently contacted by a young lady named Caitlin that had found our show through some means, and she was quite upset at the fact that um, we didn't give her favorite movie of all time, which she says is a five, but at worst a four, Titanic anything better than i think we were in the threes like i gave it a 325 i think you yeah. were close to that i think gi gary was close to that so she kind of reached out to me said I, I found your show and your ratings on titanic were fucking terrible um so i said well look i want to save a, a, a listener i don't want to drive someone away so i said let's make it up to you what's a movie that you love that you would just like to hear us talk about that would get you to come back to the pint and forget about our very accurate by the way rating of titanic which is way too fucking long um, way too long. <laughs> and, uh, she said Mars attacks. And, uh, funnily enough, when I asked her what she would give Mars attacks, she said a three out of five. So I don't know what the logic behind that is, but maybe it's just, I think maybe it's just like the cheese factor. She said she really enjoys this movie. So okay, this one is for regular listener, Caitlin, uh, and nobody else gets this. So it's we only love Caitlin. regular listeners. Come on. We absolutely do. We absolutely Caitlin, do. We love you, uh, regardless of our rating for this movie. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing. We'll have to see how if she if she just closes the book on the pint uh, after this episode because it's very possible. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Mars Attacks, originally slated for a summer of '96 release, uh, came out on December 13 of 1996. Uh, and if you, anyone who doesn't know, basically, it's a uh, very black, uh, dark comedy, sci-fi comedy, based on the Topps trading card series of the same name from the 1960s. Yeah. Came out in 62. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about those cards, man. It's fucking crazy nuts cards. Um, so they featured the artwork of uh, sci-fi artist Wally Wood and Norman Saunders. They told the story arc of an invasion on Earth by some cruel Martians uh, you get more of the backstory. I guess there's there's a uh, government trying to conceal the fact that Mars was doomed to explode, and they wanted to colonize Earth. Um, and the cards showed, uh, you know, futuristic battle scenes, bizarre methods of attack and torture and slaughter of humans. Uh, it was very popular with children, uh, but eventually it was it was pan it was it was cut short because of the explicit gore and implied sexual content. Oh, I like implied yeah. sexual content. Yeah, right. Imagine a bunch of like eight year old kids reading this shit and looking yeah. at it. They they look very much like the movie. Yeah, I know the like, Martians. Those cards are very similar. Yeah. And the original idea, I guess, because there was a set called Dinosaurs Attack. That's right. And that was originally pitched to Tim Burton and he was like, hey, uh, 
Jurassic Park came out like two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. I've got some, I got some of that in my notes. Uh, this was directed, like John said, by Tim Burton. Uh, we talked about him very recently with um, uh, Ed Wood. And funny enough, this this movie is sort of an homage to that Ed Wood style. Uh, not sort of. It, it is an homage to that Ed Wood style. And it's his movie right after Ed Wood. Too. Yeah, it's the next one. Yep. Screenplay by Jonathan Gems. Uh, this guy also wrote uh, the adaptation of George Orwell's novel 1984. Uh, he also did some uncredited rewrite, rewrite work on Batman. Uh, also Tim Burton, also Jack Nicholson. And something that I thought was pretty cool is he wrote, he wrote a lot of unproduced stuff, uh, including a script for Burton, uh, a Beetlejuice sequel. Oh, Beetlejuice goes to Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Beetlejuice goes Hawaii and something like that. Yeah. Beetlejuice goes Hawaii. Correct. So yeah. uh, I don't know. Do we, do we want that in the world? Well, you know, Beetlejuice two is coming out, right? Tim Burton uh, just made it. Is it that? So it is not that. No. That, okay. All that right. was the long rumored, scripted sequel that was supposed to come out years ago and they never did it but now right. they're doing it you know uh, with uh jenna ortega and all that so i'll, I'll tell you a little about uh, that delay uh so this thing started in 1985 um by alex cox who had success with things like repo man and sid and nancy so he he pitched it to orion and trisar as sort of a joint venture of the mars attacks trading cards even back then uh, he wrote he wrote some drafts and then he was released and and uh, another guy Martin uh, Amis I guess or Amos I don't know um, then he replaced him and but that didn't get anywhere and then then it was uh, ended up in this like development hall I guess they call it a turnaround yeah where it just can't get out of development and they hire you know some outside assistance so that started eighty five so now jump ahead to ninety three Jonathan Gems is hired. Uh, and he's the one who pitched uh, that, you know, dinosaurs attack as sort of a companion piece to the Mars attack movie. But like you said, he was a little smarter than that. I say, hey, there's something out there, you know, it's called Jurassic Park. Circa 1993 to 1995, seven, even 98, even even to today. It's like, don't just don't touch dinosaur shit. It's right. just, yeah. you know, it, it, it's too it was too big of a movie to to really go back to that. So Burton wanted to do this thing kind of like uh, the old 70s disaster films, which I used to love those. How about you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Irwin Allen stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the whole A-list ensemble cast, um, like the Poseidon Venture and Towering Inferno, stuff like that. Uh, so that, that was the intent. Um, and they, they certainly did have an A-list cast. Uh, you'll get to that soon enough. Oh, yeah. But he also uh, was busy preparing Ed Wood at the time, and he wanted to, um, like I said, pay homage to those kind of films, such as uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space and lots of 50s sci-fi B-movies, Invaders from Mars, War of the Worlds, stuff like that. So this was written in 94. It was completed, uh, planned to release in 93. But Warner Brothers had a bit of a problem. Because they estimated the budget at around two hundred and sixty million, nineteen ninety four. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, and they were they were happier with something more like sixty million. <laughs> it's funny because that cold open with the burning cows. Yeah, that was like a sticking point for them. He every rewrite he wouldn't get rid of that. So they're like, all right, we're gonna get someone else in here. Uh, well, he comes back around and finishes it, and you know we get what we get. Uh, we'll see what the actual budget was. So it was filmed from August 95 until February. I'm sorry. It was delayed from August 95 until February of uh, 96. And it filmed from February to June of that year uh, in a lot of places. Uh, a lot of stuff in Arizona, as you could probably tell. Uh, Inglewood, California. Argentinos, uh, Argentina, Buenos Aires. Um, the Landmark Cartel in Las Vegas, Nevada. And some places in Wichita, Kansas. New York City and Washington DC. Yeah, it's it definitely has a lot of a, filming locations. It's got a kind of a global feel to it, or at least yeah. across the US feel to it, yeah. Yeah, so I've talked enough. What what do you uh, have for the cast on this and the budget? Hey, who the fuck are you? Huh? Who the fuck are you? All right, so the cast, we start off with the man that always gets billed first apparently, 
especially in Tim Burton movies, even when he doesn't play Batman. <laughs> uh, we get Jack Nicholson in a dual role. He plays President James Dale, the very kind of uh, even keeled, mild, not mild mannered, but just very presidential president <laughs> of the United States. Um, and then on the other side, he plays a sleazy Las Vegas casino owner named Art Land. Man, uh, Manster, I'll ask you right off the bat. Do you think that the dual role was necessary? Uh, no, no, it wasn't. But and I'm sure you might talk about this, but he wanted to play every role. Oh, I, that I didn't know. Yeah, that's, okay. that's what I read. He wanted to play every role. <laughs> I did read that initially Michael Keaton was going to play Artland and he couldn't because of filming on something else. So Jack Nicholson took over the role. Yeah, I could um, see. Uh, I could see Keaton as that. Yeah. Of course, you know Jack Nicholson from, as we mentioned, Batman, The Departed, one of Lloyd's favorite movies, The Shining. Um, the First Lady, Marsha Dale, is played by Glenn Close. Of course, we know Glenn Close from the television show Damages. She was in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. And of course, uh, she will not be ignored in Fatal Attraction. And she will take your daughter on a fucking roller coaster oh, fuck. and then boil the bunny while at it. Um, so be very careful if you ever fuck around on your wife with Glenn Close. Um, she's, she's a funny character because she's just like a very kind of vapid, uh, materialistic first lady. And she, when she gets killed by a chandelier, right. it's, it's entirely a dummy and it's hilarious. It, just, it is great. <laughs> I, gets, I love her uh, expressions right before the chandelier. Yeah. Kind of like Bride of Frankenstein, looking one way, looking the other way. Yeah. And she's and she's more worried about the chandelier than the yeah. fact that she's going to get crushed right. by it. Nancy Reagan's chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annette Benning plays Barbara Land, the wife of the other Jack Nicholson character, Art Land. She is an ex-alcoholic. She's very hippy dippy, very in tune with her feelings. Annette Benning was originally going to play Catwoman in Tim Burton's Batman Returns, but got pregnant by her husband Warren Beatty and came out. And of course, we got Michelle Pfeiffer. Annette Benning is like. Is like your mom's friend that you want to fuck. Oh. Like, do you feel that? Do you feel that too? Oh, oh, I feel way more than that. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Annette Benning has a real, like, if she was my my aunt, but removed by marriage, so like my uncle's wife, and like she came on to me, I think I think that I would I would have to be an aunt fucker at that point. I would, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, I'm glad you feel the same way. Oh, that, uh, the incredibly, just... It, I don't want to get gross, but she's just very beautiful and pleasing. <laughs> yeah, pleasing. That's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> it's simultaneously good and descriptive and also kind of gross, and I like that. <laughs> I like that. Uh, she was in uh, The Great Outdoors with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd. American Beauty, returning from uh, our recent GoldenEye episode, um, is uh, Pierce Brosnan. It's Professor David Kessler. He is the uh, White House's main scientist. He's a pipe-smoking <laughs> English douchebag. Um, <laughs> he was James Bond in four films. As we mentioned, he was in the very recent and very terrible black Adam as Dr. Fate. And he's in Miss Doubtfire. He is the victim of the run by fruiting. It was a run by fruiting. Uh, that Miss Doubtfire throws an orange at his head nearby a pool. Uh, Martin short plays press secretary, Jerry Ross. I love Martin short and I love him in this role. Cause he, he doesn't normally play a scumbag. Yes. Very scummy. But he's a hooker, uh, a hooker getting. He's a frequent John. Yeah, he's a frequent yeah. John. Yeah, <laughs> he's a frequent John. And ends up getting, uh, getting a lot of people in trouble. You know Martin Short from uh, Inner Space, uh, SCTV, a uh, great Canadian uh, television show back in the late seventies, early eighties, and of course SNL. After right, that, right before this show, um, my kids turned on Santa Claus Three upstairs. And he was in that. He played yeah. Jack Frost. Yep. Another yeah, he's bag in that, I guess. He's all over the place. Oh, he's on that great Hulu show, uh, Only Murders in the Building. I don't watch that, but I've uh, heard it's pretty good. Yeah. I've heard it's pretty good. Um, Michael J. Fox in what was his final film role until 2014. I didn't even remember he was in this movie. Mm. Um, he plays Jason Stone. He is kind of a douchebag uh, news reporter. Very career oriented. He hates his uh, girlfriend's dog, but he loves his girlfriend. He very clearly loves his girlfriend. Yeah. Um, you know him, of course, from Back to the Future 1 through 3, Spin City, Family Ties. And I read this and I didn't notice it, but he 
right around this time had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Okay. And I read that in the scene where he gets killed, when the attack happens and he's running to, to Sarah Jessica Parker's character to save her, that he was actually trembling. And I don't know if Tim Burton knew if he disclosed it, but apparently they worked it into the scene where it looked like he was just in fear. But apparently okay. it was actual, like the beginning's onset of Parkinson's disease was hitting him. I was wondering yeah. how far or, you know, how that close that was to his filming of this movie. Yeah, because the Frighteners is the same year. And I know that he had already been diagnosed when he did the Frighteners. So mm. Natalie Portman plays Taffy Dale, the first <laughs> daughter um, this is young Natalie Portman before Star Wars, after Leon the Professional. You also know her from V for Vendetta. And a movie that I just fucking hated. A lot of people love Annihilation. Did you ever oh, see Annihilation? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I remember thinking it was okay. Didn't like it. Um Who's that other one? Black Swan? Yeah, I didn't see Black Swan. Yeah. But uh, but people have told me there's a there's a lesbian scene between her and Mali Kunis. Yes. So I'll probably be seeing Black Swan. Uh, <laughs> Listeners, uh, anyone want to throw it out there? If you, yeah, if you, if you want to hear Black Swan, we'll gladly watch that for other reasons. Uh, Jack Black, a skinny young Jack oh Black, my God, yeah. by the way, plays Billy Glenn Norris, a young man that joins up uh, with the U.S. military. U.S. Well, military in this movie, Billy by the way. Glenn. Billy Glenn, yeah. Uh, he, he's a, His family is a real bunch of like uh, kind of trailer park yokels. Jack Black, well, what I was going to say was... The military in this film, even though the movie takes place in the 90s, all the military uniforms and gear look like 50s. The the tanks are 50s tanks. The the uniforms are 50s. So they they, they tried to take that that 50s Martian Ed Wood ray gun aesthetic and and kind of plug it into 1996. You know him, of course, from Tenacious D, uh, the heaviest band on Earth, Orange County, and School of Rock. All right, a couple more here. There's a this is a large this cast. One more. <laughs> yeah, I'm only going to do two more. I'm only doing two more. Uh, Lucas Haas yeah. uh, plays Richie Norris, who is the brother of Billy Rain, uh, Billy Glenn Norris. Um, he is like kind of like the young emo looking alternative kid who has a heart of gold, loves his grandmother. In the end, ends up saving the day. Uh, you know him probably best from as the little kid in Witness, right? With Harrison Such Ford. A good movie. That is a great movie. Let's do that movie. Yeah, let's do Witness. All right, we're doing Witness. All right. Um, he was also an in Inception in the very beginning of the movie. In, a, in Inception, he is the architect that screws up, and they're taking him away. He's only in one scene. Uh, and he's also in a movie called Alpha Dog, which is really good if you've never seen it. It's a hard watch, but it's really good. Hmm. The last person I'll mention is uh, playing ex-boxing champion Byron Williams is Jim motherfucking Brown. Jim, Jim Brown, Brown died in March of uh, this year. Uh, and I've got none of his acting credits for you, but let's, let's just go over some of his NFL resume. Three time NFL MVP, 1957, 1958, and 1965. NFL rookie of the year, 1957, and nine straight Pro Bowls from 57 to 65, widely considered by many for a long time to be the greatest running back of all time, and also widely revered for the fact that he just retired in his prime. He just said, I'm done. And fucking quit football. Yeah. What so, year was that? 65 was his last year. 65. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a rookie of the year in MVP of the same year. Yeah. That's fucking insane. Fucking nuts. And that was also around the time pre Super Bowl when the, I think the Browns won. I don't think he was part of all the teams, but the Browns won like fucking 10 championships yeah. in a row. <laughs> Remember, like, it's so weird to say a word like, like, or a, a sentence like when the Browns won a championship, <laughs> let alone 10 in a row. <laughs> Uh, all right, man, sir, let's get into this movie. How do we start off? Wow. Uh, that fucking cold open, I guess. That's a good starting point. Super cold open. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happens in that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're just, where is it? Kansas? I mean, it, you Lockjaw? do get. Lockjaw? Was it Lockjaw? Yeah, Lockjaw. Lockjaw, yeah. Kansas. And uh, just, just some sheriff or some some law uh, comes riding around. And this uh, Asian fella is doing some, some work. And he's like, oh, are you having a barbecue? The guy's like, no. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of burning cows come running down the road. Yeah, it's weird. Just Crazy. And then, then you see a spaceship take off in the background. It is a strange cold open. Then we get the... Imagine how tasty that must have smelled, though. It Well, I work next to a Burger King, and I could, I could tell you <laughs> that smell is, is, is pervasive. You walk yeah. outside some days around lunchtime, and you're like, fuck, I didn't want a Whopper like 10 minutes ago, but now I want a Whopper. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> I just I just want to eat meat. I don't I don't even care about the bun or any of the other stuff. I just want a couple discs of meat. <laughs> <laughs> Flame broiled. Um all right. So then we get a great credit sequence that is essentially showing us uh this alien armada launching from Mars. We get the we talked about this in the Ed Wood episode. Danny Elfman is back and it means a lot yeah. in this movie, right? Yeah. We get that Danny Elfman score that's very Danny Elfman ish. So perfect for this. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. A lot of it almost sounds like theremin y type noises and stuff. Um, but we see like just what seems to be thousands of Martian ships. And the Martian ships, Lloyd, as we said, the 50s aesthetics, they're classic, cool. right? Classic flying saucer. Yeah. You know, it's got the bump in the middle and point on the ends. And looks like, uh, was it the day the Earth stood still? I thought of that movie. Yeah, I yeah, thought about that movie definitely. as soon as soon as that started. So then as the movie goes along, there's a lot of moving pieces, but we start to meet all of the cast. By the way, apparently there are, I think I read 23 kind of major roles in this film. And initially mm. there was something like 52 oh. that they, they cut it down to 23. Um, and it feels like 23 because there's there's people that are in this that you forget they're in it. Because they're only in, like, for example, Sarah Jessica Parker and Pierce Brosnan. Oh, right. In my head, I always think of them as being in this movie heavily. They're not. They're they. You go to the <laughs> alien ship, and they're there, right? Yeah. So we meet the president, his wife, and his daughter Taffy. Taffy is kind of like the disaffected teen. Um, we meet Art Land and his wife Barbara. He's a scummy uh, Las Vegas uh, real estate uh, casino guy. And she's clearly like this woman who's struggling with alcoholism and also just like she wants something new. When the, when the aliens come, she embraces it to begin yeah. with. We meet Jason Stone, played by Michael J. Fox, who is a serious reporter for a, 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 a company called GNN, which is obviously CNN. And then his girlfriend, played by uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, who is like she's like Ricky Lake. She has this like very kind of like dumb celebrity yeah. show but he gets mad because she keeps on like scooping all of his all his, yeah she's got a little chihuahua with her yeah so uh so, by the way let, let's let's settle this once and for all manster sarah jessica parker hmm. just on looks alone always gets a bad rap i'm gonna be totally honest i don't think she's unattractive well how do you feel uh-huh I think she has her moments uh, of looking very attractive. She, she has an incredible body and, and I'm sure she works very hard to keep, keep in that kind of shape. Uh, I'm very impressed by it. Um, uh, her looks does, doesn't really turn me on though. Okay. That's fair. But, you know, she's, she's a beautiful woman. The haircut doesn't do anything for me in this, yeah. in this yeah. film. Yeah. She has a short bob cut and not that there's anything wrong with that. I think shortcuts are very attractive, but hers doesn't work. Um, all right. So on this episode of The Pint Objectifies Women, we have now covered <laughs> uh, Annette <laughs> Benning and uh, Sarah Michelle Geller. Or, I'm sorry, Sarah Jessica Parker right. uh, in their attractiveness. Sarah Michelle Geller. Well, what do you think? Just real quick. What do you think of her? I think she's pretty hot. I, uh, like I would I would pick her over the other Sarah. OK. All right. Fair. <laughs> um, so we meet them. We meet the Norris family, which is uh, the guy we just talked about in Goldeneye very recently. Um, Joe Don Baker. He's the father, yes. and then his sons are Lucas Haas and Jack Black. Lucas Haas, as I mentioned, is um, like kind of emotional teen that works younger in a, teen, yeah, yeah, donut shop, and 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 the other son is like the gung ho, going to join the military. Very flamboyant, it? like uh, uh, the Jack Black character, Billy Glenn, Billy Billy Glenn, <laughs> Billy Glenn, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. got a, a incredibly hot girlfriend in, in um, Christina Applegate, yeah. Yep. Another another cameo there. And got that short crop military do, but he's very uh, uh I don't know, is it flamboyant? Is that the word I'm even looking for? I think you're missing it on that one. I think yeah, maybe he's something. I think RuPaul is flamboyant. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't mean it like that. It's just something about him that really makes him stand out. He's kind of boisterous a little bit. I think that yeah. might be the word. Maybe. Yeah. All right. On this episode of the pint, does no words. <laughs> yeah, no words to describe. <laughs> um, so, well, oh fuck! I should have written it down. Sylvia Sweet. Oh, the, the older woman. The older grandma. Woman. The grandma. Yeah, she Sylvia. is. Yeah, look that up for me. She Last plays. 
it, it was her last role as well. Yeah. Uh, she was 85 and died at 88 three years later. Um, old school Hollywood uh, actress. Sylvia she, Sidney. Sylvia Sidney. She played the the woman in Beetlejuice who transitioned Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis through the afterlife. Smoked through her neck hole. She's, <laughs> yeah. She is so fucking awesome in this movie. She's so, I'm going to just go out there and say it for an 85 year old woman. She's so cute. She's got that little Bob haircut and she's always smiling and just happy. I, I understand fully why Richie so desperately wants to save her at the end of the movie. She's great. She is awesome. And, yeah, and, like, and spo- spoiler alert, she ends up saving the day almost entirely yeah. <laughs> uh, w- with her weird choice of music, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Thomas. <laughs> Tom Richie. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thomas. <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, it was just a trivia bit, but it, I don't think it was like actually don't think it happened because of this. But Jack Black's real first name is Thomas. Uh, so because he's the first person she does that to in the movie, she calls him right. Thomas. Um, so we go along and we we, we meet Jim Brown. He's an ex uh, prize fighter who is working in a casino kind of in a celebrity uh, role, King like Tut a role, King Tut meter and greeter. He is divorced from but still in love with pam greer who lives in washington dc they have two kids yes one of those kids the older one is ray j if you don't know who ray j is he is the brother of brandy norwood the r&b singer and he's the dude that fucked kim kardashian in that uh home video that's like you know years ago oh yeah that that's <laughs> ray that's ray j <laughs> um what i like about this movie it's it's gonna sound corny as hell to say but i love the fact that in a big Hollywood movie, they give the black male character. He wants to get back to his family. He wants to be with his wife. Still. He wants to be with his kids. A lot of times, unfortunately you get that kind of stereotype of, you know, like, uh, Oh, like he left the family and everything and he's no good. I like the fact that they wrote this where it's like, he's trying, they're trying to make things work even after they didn't work. Yeah. So, um, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, we'll jump ahead a little bit. His final moment, like in the end of the awesome, great character. It's a great character. Um, so we kind of, we kind of meet all these people and we meet them under the, uh, the situation of the Martians are, are coming to earth and it's all very, uh, well, are they here to say hi? What's going on? There are two different generals, Manster. Yeah, the two, the two generals. How would you describe their their opposing uh, viewpoints? Yeah, you got you got the Colin Powell general, yeah. uh, <laughs> who is very uh, diplomatic. You know, he just wants to treat these Martians, you know, like foreign dignitaries. Like you know, give them every opportunity they can. Um, and the other one um, is more the like the the patent, and and he just fucking wants to blow them up. He mentions he mentions nuclear <laughs> warfare yeah. about seventy six times in the movie, yeah. right from the beginning. Uh, that's Rod Steiger, by the way, and uh, yeah, and the Colin Powell ish uh, character is uh, is Paul Winfield, who's a great character actor, Star Trek Two, The Terminator. Um, but yeah, so these guys are, are are have these diametrically opposing views of what to do with these Martians coming. And the president decides to go with which one in terms of uh, of giving him the reins, Manster. Yeah, he goes with uh, Paul Winfield, uh, the Colin Powell type. Yeah. And uh, when they do have their meeting, uh, I guess we should go there next, right? Let's go. What happens, Manster? Yeah, let's go. So they meet in the desert. You know, they, they land in the desert because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So you might as well meet there where it's kind of safe. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the president is not allowed to go. Um, but they go and meet him. There's a lot of people there, man. When you see it from, uh, Annette Benning's view. Yeah. Right. I look down, I'm like, damn, that's like bigger than like Woodstock. There's so many people there. Uh, and of course, you know, their, their ship lands and they've, <laughs> they've got the scientists and, uh, they, they've got the little contraption that's supposed to, um, the universal translator, translator. universal translator. And I don't, what did, what do you think about that translator? Do you think they really created something that translated or do you think they just pre-programmed, pre-programmed what they wanted people to hear? I felt like it was pre-programmed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause when they, the, when they do come out and you know, these, these are Martians, um, uh, you've probably seen the pictures, very big and brainy heads, very short. Um, 
and and when when the spaceship lay on the ramp rolls out like a tongue, which I yeah. thought was was pretty cute. That was good. Um, and the way that Martians move, they just sort of I don't know. They you don't see their feet ever. They yeah, it seems like they're, they're seem floating to just almost float and hover across. Um, and of course, you know, saying, "Oh, we come in peace," and uh, everyone's clapping, and and Annette Benning is so happy, and um, some some hippie is so happy that he releases a duff. Some dude that looks like he just came from a fish concert. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what happens with the duff? Well, he releases a dove. I forgot that this is the impetus of what happens in this movie. Um, I was going to even ask you, do you think the dove is what made them attack, or do you think it was just they were going to do it anyway? I had the exact same question for yeah. you. Yeah, um, I don't know. I have Looking no idea. at it, I'm assuming they were going to attack. It seems like they were they were here to attack, you know? Yeah. So the dove flies up, and everything. everybody's having this wonderful moment, oh. and uh, the dove flies close to the Martian ambassador, and he reaches into his, uh, his robe, Pulls out a, uh, a very, again, all the instruments, backpacks, and everything are very 50s sci-fi, kind of rounded off, you know, horn-shaped. Pulls his little ray gun out, and he blasts the dove into a million pieces. Then he proceeds to blast Paul Winfield into a million pieces, and then it just becomes fucking chaos. Now, man, yeah, it was before- it's more like uh, one piece. Yeah, they, well, it just they, dropped, they, they right? They shoot him, and... The, the body just sort of burns and leaves the skeleton, right? And in this yeah. case, some feathers. Uh, what's funny, though, because I was looking at some of the images on the cards. The cards are actually titled Burning Flesh, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you see, just like when Jack Black, you know, got the ray gun, the head is there and fully intact, but the body is burning underneath it as a skeleton. I thought that was a pretty cool uh, effect. The effects and of, I guess the... of the ray gun. The ray gun are pretty cool overall. Yeah, yeah, so you got the green and the and the red ray guns too. Yeah, well, the, and and part of the reason I read was it was they thought it was going to be released towards Christmas. I don't know if that's true or oh, not. Okay, but so explain that. What are the what are the green ray guns and red ray? They do the same thing, but what do yeah, they, they leave behind? They they leave behind the um a, a recolored <laughs> skeleton. So if you get shot with a green ray gun, your your skeleton's green, and same with the red. Yeah, it's red. Likewise. So total chaos erupts. The Martians just start fucking blasting everything. Michael J. Fox tries to save Sarah Jessica Parker. He gets killed. Um, the Jack Black character, he gets killed very gruesomely. As you said, he gets disintegrated like up to his head and then just like fucking fades away. Um, and in the uh, chaos, the Martians um, take off, but they take the Pierce Brosnan character. They take the Sarah Jessica no, Parker she gets character. Taken the, Pierce gets taken the next time, but this time they take, they take uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and the dog and the dog. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. And then they eventually take Pierce Brosnan. Yeah. These, these two characters end up becoming, first of all, they, they fall in love because she interviewed him earlier in the movie, even though they're totally different people. Um, you know, they, they were flirting and there was a connection there. But what ends up happening to each of them on the ship, Manster, that when we go back, we see every time. So when we go back on the ship uh, soon after this attack, uh, you see them on the ship and and the Martians are all just playing. I would want to say experimenting. Yeah. But it was more like they were just playing and having fun with the body parts. You know, the hand that they took from Michael J. Fox and uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and so on. What you eventually see is they've got a glass enclosed, you know, with some fluid inside and inside the glass is her head. And then she sees her body and uh, with with a headless body. You know, you don't see it quite yet, but there's something that <laughs> there's a switch made after that. Yeah, they end up taking her chihuahua's head, putting it on her body and her head <laughs> on the chihuahua's body, which um, is very disturbing. It is disturbing. And when they get Pierce Brosnan, they just vivisect him. He's just like yeah. a head and his lungs are hanging up. And I think you see his heart and his circulatory system. Right. So those two are just, they're, they're playing out fucked. Um, everybody is, is having different ideas. Uh, what's happening? You know, what should we do? But then the Martians come right. out, man, sir. Right. Yeah, there's, there's reports. So you're, you know, you're eventually back in the white house and, and, um, I don't remember. I think it was Pierce Brosnan brought in the report saying, oh, guess what? 
it was all a misunderstanding. Yeah. <laughs> the Martians, they gave us an official uh, apology, and it's all misunderstanding. And, you know, everything's good. They want to apologize to Congress, <laughs> which is which is the fucking funniest thing in this whole movie is how is how dumb everybody is in this movie. So the Martians are like, my bad. Right. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. We, we missed. We 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 uh, we acted wrong. Um, bring us to Congress and we're going to apologize for all of this. Yeah. Um, and everybody's like, is it a good idea? And they're like, well, obviously they, you know, they made a mistake. So let's let's just let them talk it out. Yeah. And of course, the Rod Steiger character. Blowing the fuck up. Yeah, he wants him destroyed. Right. Um, the, the president has to be told by his press secretary, like, well, he's like, well, I want to be there. And the press secretary is like, well, we can't have the branches in the same yeah. room together. So Congress oh, you know shows what else? up. Oh, I'm sorry. You no, know no, what else I liked? Um, shortly after the Mars, you know, the first attack, you're back in the White House and you're with the family with um, Jack Nicholson, Glenn Close, and Natalie Portman. And Natalie Portman goes, you know, maybe the dove signifies war for them. Maybe it's just a misunderstanding of culture, you know? Right. And they're like, yeah, you know, that could very well be. And then comes this, <laughs> comes the next attack. The next attack is the, is the Congress. Right? So once they're in Congress, like you said, um, <laughs> they give him the podium, right? He, he, the Martian gets up there at the podium. Congress is in front of him and he's about to say something. <laughs> He just whips that gun out. He, he fries. He's blasted. He fries everybody. In everybody. Congress. Everybody. And the grandmother yeah. is watching and she just laughs and goes, they killed Congress. Yeah, that was so funny. I also like before the Congress murder, when when everybody's outside of, of the Capitol building and they're waiting to see what happens, the, the guards are standing there and one of the guards is holding a sign that says no birds. No birds, right. No applause. <laughs> No applause, no birds. No birds. <laughs> <laughs> but then you do get that moment back back with uh, Natalie Portman. She's just lying on the couch, like lounging on the couch. And she goes, oh, I guess it wasn't the dove. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they take off again. Uh, they, they start to fire back at them. Rod Steiger is on top of a tank with a fucking, with old painless from Predator blasting away. And, and the Martians get away again. So the Martians now... Their main goal is they want to kill the president. They send in an infiltrator. <laughs> uh, this is one of the best. This is probably the most, besides the Martians, this is probably the most visually memorable character of this movie. Uh-huh. We mentioned her in Ed Wood, Lisa Marie, Tim Burton's ex fiance who played Vampira in Ed Wood. She's gorgeous, but she's like modelly looking. Uh. And she's so bizarre. So f- plastic and fake looking. And her walk must mm-hmm. have taken, her walk must have taken weeks to get that right with like movement coaches. I didn't you, look up, I didn't look up anything, but I can only imagine. I didn't either, but you know what it reminded me of? So if you can, if you can imagine her walk, she swayed her arms. She, yeah, like, her arms like are back constantly. and forth, like not like sideways. And do you remember, I think it was the first season of Star Trek Discovery with Doug Jones. Remember oh, Doug Jones? how he, how he walks. Yeah, yeah. He did like something very similar. Yeah. But he does his like behind his back. Yeah. His hands sway. But and it was she another does, very awkward walk. Yeah. She does this whole thing. Now she's playing a, a, we find out it's a Martian in a costume to look like a beautiful woman to trick the, the Martin Shore character. Cause right. he's a, he's a John. With the um, torpedo boobies. She has torpedo boobies. Right. A giant bouffant hairdo, which is there to disguise the fact that she has the giant Martian skull. Yeah. But one of the things I read about this was every day she had to be sewn in and out of that dress. Oof. Yeah. Like that, that there was no zippers. It was sewn around her. So he takes her into the White House. He, he, he gets her in. And in he the brings Kennedy her, room. the Kennedy room, which is like the, the fuck room, um, giant aquarium, one of those round beds for like Austin powers that yeah, spins around. Right. And, uh, and she ends up killing him and getting loose in the white house. And she very, very closely almost kills the president and his wife, but is saved at the last minute by what one of his, uh, one of his, the, the, the guy that looks like Drew Carey almost right. The main, 
oh, Secret that... Service guy. I think he. I think he. He stopped. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. He's like, yeah, that's my job. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, that's my job. So, Manster, where do we go from here? We have, we we have everything is kind of falling apart. The the Martians are clearly winning. Um, we're introduced again. We go back to Artland uh, in Vegas. Vegas gets attacked. This is where the movie really loses me. Yeah, me too. Because um, there's a lot going on. So this this movie, it's it, it's an hour and forty hour and forty five minutes. It's tops. not super long. Yeah, it's not super long. But to me, it feels like it's a two and a half hour movie. I'm gonna 100 percent agree with you that the okay. second half the second half moves at like a very weird pace, and we start getting into you know, like the idea of um, the Jim Brown character just wants to get back to Washington D.C. to be with Pam. Yeah, there, there's a lot of little side plots that. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I a lot of I get bored with them all. And this is where characters start to come together. You know, yeah. like we have like the Barbara Land character meeting. Uh, Art Land gets killed. Uh, at one point, there is a there's a a Martian in a giant like uh, Jaeger from Pacific Rim, like oh, you're right. running running around like destroying things. Jason Ritchie from the trailer park. Yeah, Richie Richie's like I have to get back and save grandma at the uh at the you know the nursing home. So yeah, his we, dad's like fuck grandma, you're staying here and defending us. You're defending this mobile home is what he <laughs> that, says. Dad. Yeah. Um so he goes back to help her out. Uh let me see what else uh we briefly meet Danny DeVito um as a as credited as rude gambler. He's only in a couple scenes. Yeah. Um what about so, uh, all the guys in the in the casino? He had like a big power, like he was trying to capitalize on. Yeah, it, it, it just so I don't many know. different things going on. It really was too much. It, it it did start to kind of expand a little bit too much. Um, we were introduced all of a sudden to Tom Jones. <laughs> yeah, um, it, we we do get a great performance of "It's Not Unusual," <laughs> of um, course, and we find out that he uh, he could fly a plane, which is very important to the uh, to the plot of the film. Manster, let's just get to the end. Let's get to how how this thing kind of wraps up. What is the secret weapon in destroying the alien menace? So, yeah, the secret weapon we discover when, uh, so we see grandma sitting in her nursing home, just got some headphones on, um, listening to some, uh, uh, Slim Whitman, Slim Whitman. Yeah. Like our, uh, album LP record. And she can't hear what's going on around her. She doesn't know the aliens have invaded. And so there's these couple of like very, vindictive i don't know these these crazy aliens that they're they're like instead of just shooting her like with their little handheld ray gun they decide to bring in some big guns yeah right get this massive thing uh and point it you know put it one inch away from her head and and try and get that in the meantime well we know richie is on his way to save grandma uh and he does he saves her and um i guess (sighs) I don't know exactly how. I, oh, she takes off her headphones. That's what it is. Her headphones come the off. The music that she was listening to is all of a sudden out in the open, and the, the Martians' brains start quivering, and then they just explode in some green uh, gunk and gel and disgustingness. Two things about that right off the bat. One, to talk about the Martians. Initially, the budget was much higher because initially they hired, I didn't write his name down a special effects wizard to make all the Martians out of stop motion animatronics. Mm, Yep. And they realized that by using CGI, they could save like $40 million. So they credited him as helping to design the Martian characters, but they did not go with stop motion. Very Purvis. Very Purvis. I almost wonder if I would have enjoyed stop motion a little bit more. Um, But yeah, they were very quirky, weird. It's I mean, 19- it fits the style of the movie, so. Yeah, it's ni- it's 1996 CGI, which, again, isn't always an answer for everything because Jurassic Park was 1993 and that was perfect. But um, the other thing is in, like, 1982, Howard Stern, did you yes. read this? Yes, Howard I did. Howard Stern, yeah, had, had a skit uh, that he did, I think, with Fred Norris called something along the lines of, like, Slim Whitman versus the, versus the Aliens. Right. And, and it was a sketch they did. And the end result idea was that there was an alien attack on Earth and the music of Slim Whitman was all that could defend people. 
There's no and way that that wasn't ripped off. It was totally ripped off. And yeah. he actually had apparently Tim Burton on at one point and he had brought it up and he played the original tape back to him. And this is years later. This is like in the two thousands and uh, Tim Burton, his only answer was you should have sued me. Like yeah, right. he, he didn't deny it, but he, he claims he didn't, you know, cause he didn't write it. Yeah. But he's like, well, you should have sued me. Right. But yeah. So th- this idea could have been stolen from a sketch on the Howard Stern show in 1982 um, but yeah, the sw- Slim Whitman, mu- Slim Whitman music fucks these aliens up. I don't blame them because it's a yeah, bunch that, of yodeling. It was like yodeling. It was just so awful. It's like country yodeling too. It's yeah. not like, you know, it, it's like, woo, woo, woo. it's just all that shit. Um, and yeah, they just start to mount speakers on vehicles and they start driving around. And, and, uh, in the meantime, our president, James Dale, um, Two Batman things I want to point out in this movie. Number one, there's a scene where uh, J- Jack Nicholson as James Dale, President James Dale, uh, addresses the nation. It's it's just about the same as when the Joker addresses Gotham. The same, he's sitting the same way. He's speaking in the same cadence. Uh. Yeah. Um, and then the other part is is in Batman, the Joker kills one of the one of the um. The fucking mafia guys with a handshake with a with a fake buzzer, oh, an electrified that's right. buzzer. And in this movie, the way our president dies is a Martian does essentially the same thing with him, except his hand comes off and is like a fucking scorpion, yeah, and kills the president. So we we kind of get a little bit. There's a little bit of shadowing, and the reason Jack Nicholson said he did this movie is because he loved working with Tim Burton so much on Batman that uh-huh. he just wanted to do it again. So, so they start mounting up. Uh, basically weaponizing the Slim Whitman stuff, and they 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 drive the Martians off. This this kills the Martians. We kind of see you know the the cleanup of of you know trying to get the Earth back. The daughter Taffy, the the um fuck what's her name, Natalie Portman character, uh gives medals out to Richie and 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 you know basically says you save the world. And do you have by the way do you have a girlfriend? Right. <laughs> um. So we kind of get like everything wrapped up there. But I will say two things I liked about the end of this movie is at one point we see the Jim Brown character get overpowered by a bunch of Martians. Now I had not seen this movie in a long time. And I will tell you that when they're flying away and it seems like they killed him, I said, that is a fucking shitty writing job mm-hmm. because this is the guy that you're rooting for in this movie. You want him to get back home to his family. You want him to, to like get back with Pam Greer. You want him to do better than, you know, like at one point Artland offered him to be a knee breaker and he didn't want to do that. And I'm like, you're going to kill this guy. So at the very end, when Pam Greer is cleaning up the rubble of her house and you just see him walking to the building, I thought that was fucking great. Yeah, That was great. And not only you're going to kill this guy, but unseen, it was, it was a death. You thought he was dead for sure. Right. It wasn't even, you didn't even witness the death. It was just right. You just see him laying there and a uh, like a fucking phalanx of fucking Martians around yeah. him. What I like about that is I, I like the idea that we never see it, but he kicked the fuck out of all of them probably, yep. you know, to get back to his wife. But the second half I love about the end of this movie is just the very final scene of Barbara Land and Tom Jones, like at these caves, like I think in Nevada that they yeah. had said they were going to. And the movie literally ends with, with, fucking uh, like a falcon or something flying <laughs> onto Tom Jones's arm yeah. and he just starts to dance and in the background it's not unusual plays not unusual. and he, and he just goes he goes yeah and then the movie <laughs> cuts to fucking black i went okay that last fucking scene brings this movie up like a quarter of a point in yeah. my ratings and we'll okay. get to that we'll get to that all right so we talked about mars attacks let's talk about the box office so i'm talking about fractions of a penny here And uh, over time, they add up to a lot. All right. Week ending December 15th, the 13th through the 15th of 1996. Here are the top five movies of that week. Number five, Sylvester Stallone. It was out for two weeks at that point. 4.1 million daylight. Daylight. That's one where he's trapped in the Lincoln Tunnel. If you have not seen it, I'll recommend it real quick. There is a Netflix documentary. I think it's called either. It's either called Sly or Stallone. But it's all about him and his life, and he is involved in it. He's in it. It's it, it's like an interview with him. It's really fucking good. 
It's really fucking good. And something I don't think most people know about Sylvester Stallone is that as like a teenager, he was like a nationally ranked polo player. Like oh, he wow. he could have gone professional in polo, but his dad apparently was you got to watch it. His dad was kind of a shit bag and, and was kind of jealous of all of his accomplishments and, and didn't really make it easy for him to do a lot of things in life. So check that out. Sylvester Stallone, if you're a fan. Number four, um, it opened that week, $7.7 million. Uh, Whitney Houston, the preacher's wife. Number three, it had been out for three weeks, $8.9 million. I think this is the live action version starring Glenn Close, 101 Dalmatians. Opening at number two, $9.4 million, Mars Attacks. Hmm. Mars Attacks, ack, ack. And number one, $17.1 million. It opened that week as well. Manster, if I say you had me at hello, what movie am I talking about? Ah, uh, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire um, was the number one film when this came out. This film had a $100 million budget. Okay, that's what it ended up with after they changed over from the stop motion to CGI and all the other little things. So it wasn't 260. It did thir- okay. it did 37 million in the US. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It did 63 million overseas. So that is oh, it bro- it just got barely made it. Barely made it. This yeah. movie is considered a box office bomb, which I yeah. think is funny because I don't think people remember it that way. Maybe I'm wrong. But they, a lot of, you know, a lot of the people involved with this attribute the fact that this movie might not have done so well. So we talked about the dinosaur attacks, Jurassic Park thing, right? Manster, what, do you remember what movie came out in July of 1996? That was, Um, that was very similar in, in plot, but not in tone and was a huge hit. I can't remember. Independence Day. Oh, that's right. Of course. Independence Day essentially even though one's a comedy and one's not ate this movie's lunch, like mm. just fucking ate this movie's lunch. Um, so that's your box office. Let's rate this thing. Hit me with it. Just give it to me straight. Manster, I'm going to let you go first. What do you got? Uh, for- uh, I wanted you to go first. You want me to go first? Yeah. I want to hear what you got to say. All right. Patrick Flanagan, AKA P Flan, one of our insiders. Um, I don't have it up here, but he basically said this movie is, is tough. Because I don't know whether I like it or hate it. Um, and I can kind of see that. It's got an interesting beginning. There's a lot of things I like about it. I like the 50s aesthetic. I like the the A-list cast. But it does seem to, right at the halfway point, just start to completely lose steam for me. Um, the effects are fine. The Martians are are humorous. Oh, man. You know, Jack Nicholson is always great to watch. I love Pierce Brosnan. I like the cast. (sighs) This movie might be 15 minutes too long, even for an hour and 45 minute movie. 15 minutes cut out might have done this movie some justice. This is truly one of the hardest movies that we've done in a while for me to rate. Because I, I'll I'll tell you what I feel. I feel like it's a 2.75. But I think I'm going to give it a three. But I feel like either one of those is wrong at any given moment. (laughs) I hear you. So I'm going to give it a three and say, I'm not going to give it a solid three. I'm going to give it a three because I liked enough about it. It's just funny enough, but it's not too funny. Good cast. Some good stuff going on here, but it loses its way midway through. But it's not a 275 either. It's a three. I'm going to give it a three. I'm giving it a three. What do you give it? All right. Wow. It's so funny that you opened up with the uh, Patrick Flanagan because I have the exact same line as my opener. Um, Patrick did uh, say that, and I actually replied to his comment. Um, and I didn't want to give too much away, but I am in the. I have the exact same dilemma. I don't know whether I like or dislike this movie. Um, but what I can tell you, and this this makes me lean in one one way, I know that I, I when we spoke about it, <laughs> spoke. <laughs> when we, hey boss, when we spoke about it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, we, we just talked about. It. We finished talking about it, and anybody listening to this, I would think 
would say, oh, these guys like this movie. Because we didn't really say shit about this movie. Right. Right? I had to watch this movie five fucking sittings. I fell asleep each and every time watching it. Yeah, I, I didn't. Middle I watched it. I watched it. Just one. kills me. Um, like you said, there's a lot of good things that happen in it, but I think the pacing for me it doesn't work. There's too many subplots, too many things going on. There's too many characters. Not enough of the characters are actually likable. I don't think That's true. any. I think the only likable character uh, is. Um, well, Jim Brown. Right, I'll give I'll give a few likable characters. I think Richie's likable. He's oh, got totally. a good heart. And obviously grandma. All right, those two guys. Outside of that, Jim Brown. Yeah. Pam Greer. Yeah, right. Was, she's just such an ancillary character though. Like well, she only appears like on, you know, like on the telephone with him. Um and the other thing is I know there's a good joke going on in this movie, but I don't think he did a good a good job making you feel like you're in on the joke. Yeah. It's, there's just too much dull stuff. I, I really, it's so weird because I'm talking about the movies and, you know, we, we, we talked about a lot of funny scenes and, and funny things, but it's not enough for me to pull it all together in a coherent way. Um, so I, I, I don't hate it, but I, I don't particularly like it. I'm just going to give it, a two and a half out of five. Yeah, I immediately regret my three. Um, but I'm going to stick with my three because I still feel like there's enough there that it's enjoyable. Will I ever watch it again? Probably not. Yeah. I, th- I think it's it's a three based on the parts and not the sum. Um, mm-hmm. Because again, mm-hmm. again, Perfect. like what, when are you, what, you're not going to get a lot of movies with a cast like this in, in 1996 or today. Um, so that's impressive. But yeah, it's just not great. It's just not great. And I know a lot of people that I think Laura, I think redheaded uh, stranger Laura, I think she <laughs> loves this movie. I think there's yeah. a lot of people out there that love this and I don't feel the love for it. I think yeah. it's, I think it's fine. I think it's uh, got its moments, but that's it. All right. Manster, where can everybody find the pint, a pop culture podcast that we just did an episode for Caitlin, who better start listening every single week now. That's all I want yes. to say. Where, where can Caitlin find the pint? Caitlin can find us on Apple Podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Google Play Podcasts, all this, all the podcatchers. Uh, you can find us there. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook and YouTube at The Pint a Pop Culture Podcast. On Instagram and Threads, you can follow us there. There's a lot of posting going on uh, at The Pint Podcast. And of course, uh, the Patreon Insider, uh, www.patreon.com backslash the pint. Master, say the words in Martian that get us out of here. It's over, Johnny. It's over! Nothing is over! Nothing! You just don't turn it off!